God bless you guys. Welcome to Palm City Church. We're so excited that you're in the room today. And if you are watching on YouTube, maybe you were in the room and this anointed message was so great, you just had to share it with some friends. Or maybe you're still traveling. Uh, we love you. We miss you. We can't wait to see you back December 3rd right here in the room. Can we say hello to everybody, church, that's watching online? God bless you. Thanks for being here today. And uh, if we haven't met, I probably should have gave you my name. I'd love to give you a high five or, or to meet you in the lobby after the service if it's your first time. But my name is Brian, my wife's Kristen, and we are just so excited for what God's doing right here at this church. And again, I can't say it enough. You're welcome here. You, you can belong before you believe. If you're still in that valley of decision trying to figure out where your faith is, why don't you get in a room like this and let God speak to you and give you clarity. And so no matter what prerequisite you thought you had to have, what hoop you thought you had to jump through. I'm just dispelling all of those. You can come and receive what God has for you right here in this room. We won't ask you to serve. We won't ask you to give. You can just receive from the Lord. And we know as he works in your life, there will be times and places where he calls you on that journey to do some unique things. I want to uh, remind our church because it's here. We've been talking about it for seven or eight weeks. But our legacy offering is happening next Sunday, December 3rd. I'm so fired up. We opened the giving uh, platform for legacy. People are already giving. I love people who can't wait. Uh, I think that's the heart of giving. It should be a get to, not a got to. And we don't do this every week. We do this once a year. So one Sunday out of the 52, we ask everyone to participate in some way to go above and beyond your normal giving and just bring something as an offering to Christ. I always thought it was funny. It's his birthday, yet we get all the presents. What, what if we just postured our heart a little bit different and on his birthday that we would celebrate all that he has done and is doing in our life and through our life to the community around us. It's an offering that we give away through our four legacy lanes as a church. We actually just loaded our legacy report, our annual legacy report online at our website. The link is behind me. We'd love for you to check that out just so that you can see what your generosity is doing. It's a small glimpse, but a large impact. And we just, even as a 22 month old church plant said, we're not gonna wait till we're established to be a blessing. No, while we're trusting God, living the life of faith ourselves, we're gonna do everything in our power, of course, to take care of you. But that's too shallow of a mindset that God says, if you will take care of what I'm concerned about, I'll take care of you. So we've just trusted God at his word. And so we would invite you to participate. We have not had a numerical goal with our legacy offering, only a participation one. So ask God, seek him, just ask him. Here's the way we say it, pray and obey. Pray, God, what should I do? And then just obey his leading. Don't be shocked if he's more generous than you because he's God, everybody. <laughs> okay, I'm excited to dive into the word today. We've been in a series called At the Movies. Anybody enjoy that? Yeah? <laughs> Awesome. It was a lot of fun just taking uh, modern day parables or stories, which is how Jesus conveyed spiritual truths. And we found redemptive messaging in each of them so that we could learn and grow in that way. We saw a lot of people give their life to Christ. We had a lot of visitors. And so we're excited if you're here now uh, after that, but we would encourage you to keep going on the journey. The life with Christ keeps getting better and better. And what if Thanksgiving wasn't a day? What if Thanksgiving was a disposition? What if it was a mindset and a mantra that we lived with, not just on a holiday once a year, but every day of our lives? I want to talk about that for a few moments today, and then we'll pray together. But I want to look at the book of Exodus, which if you need a Bible, you can raise your hand. One of our ushers will grab you one. We have a Bible for you. If you don't have one, you also can look on your iPhone, uh, your iPad. Uh, just keep your eyelids open. Praise God. We'll, okay, stay with me. <clears throat> We're going to look at the book of Exodus today. It's the second book of your Bible. So you have the book of Genesis, which means origin, kind of where it starts, the whole story of God. As we have documented starts in Genesis, you get a lot of chapters, a lot of rich content there, a lot of theology. Then we get into this book of Exodus, which was an Exodus where God is bringing his people out of bondage into freedom. And he does so many miracles. Is anybody thankful we serve a God who didn't just do miracles, he still does miracles in our lives today? Like the fact you don't have to pay for your own sin, that's a miracle. That's a miracle that we get not what we deserve, but what Christ reserved for us in his death, burial, and resurrection. I'm so thankful for that. The mighty hand of God here in Exodus is bringing the people 
his chosen people out of captivity. They've been in bondage for 400 years. Come on, think about that. 400 years of slavery. Like 400 years of captivity, of no choices, of uh, work just beyond a normal regimen, just wear and tear, just beatings and 12-hour, 15-hour, 20-hour days of just working. And God says, enough's enough. And he, he raises up this leader called Moses. And, and if you've seen the movie, it's the let my people go, right? The story where Moses is insecure. He doesn't feel that he's adequate enough to, to, to be God's chosen person to bring his people out of slavery. But he overcomes his insecurities and he just starts trusting God and following God. Well, well the problem is Pharaoh, the, the leader of Egypt, did not worship the one true living God. He worshiped God's lowercase g. But, but he, he said, no, I got a pretty good workforce here. I ain't letting nobody go. And so God had to encourage him a little bit. And he does that through some plagues and it's frogs and locusts. It's very interesting. Why do the Bible when you can do drugs, everybody? I mean, when you, why do drugs when you can do the Bible? <laughs> Cut to tape. <laughs> huh. Don't sound about that. Are this Pump City Church? I'm not sure what they believe. <laughs> it's been three weeks, everybody. I'm a little rusty. All right? <laughs> but God brings his people out, and Pharaoh's heart finally changes after all these plagues that God sends in his life. And the people are now journeying out of captivity to the promised land, and it comes to the Red Sea. And, and with a staff in his hand, notice that God never asks you to do something that he hasn't already equipped you to do. But he put a staff in his hand. He said, that's the source. That's the vehicle at which I will use my miraculous power to bring you through a difficult situations. So he parts the Red Sea. They move through it, which, oh, by the way, the Red Sea was 221 miles wide. Come on, God's powerful. He parted the Red Sea. And he's bringing his people from bondage to freedom. Which I want to encourage you that this is the story of our life today. That God isn't just telling us a story that is no longer relevant, but he's giving us a picture of the same ideas that we have to embody today. Now, we may not be in physical captivity, but we are in spiritual captivity, in spiritual bondage until we receive Christ and begin to let the Holy Spirit do his finished work in our hearts. And God wants to take us on a spiritual journey. And I want to encourage you, if you've given your life to Christ, maybe a long time ago or even recently, and you're discouraged today because you're not doing well, it's a journey. It's not a destination. The destination's heaven. But while you're on earth, be encouraged that you can keep putting one foot in front of the other and live the life of faith God is calling you to live, and you can do it right here with us. We would invite you into that journey with us. But the problem is uh, Pharaoh changes his mind, and so he's like, you know, that was probably not a good decision. I was... I was not thinking right. Go get them. And he releases his entire army to go get the Israelites and bring them back to captivity. And we pick this up in Exodus to where God drowns all of Israel's enemies. Praise God that he always defeats your enemy. Like God doesn't have enemies. We have enemies. <laughs> but God will defeat our enemies as we trust him and live a life of faith. But let's pick this up in Exodus chapter 15. And it's a song. Sometimes in scripture you get... Uh, not just the encouragement to pray, but you get a, a recorded prayer. Sometimes in Scripture, you don't get just, hey, it's important to worship and praise. You get an actual recorded song. I'm going to read the first three verses of this song. I'd encourage you to go read it on your own time. But it's powerful, but this is where the story picks up. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. That's the Red Sea. They're like, whoa, God did it. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. So they're just all fired up. And no wonder they're singing and rejoicing. Uh, the way maker, miracle worker, promise. They're just all fired. I saw the Lord. And Miriam's getting all crazy. You get a little Pentecostal with a tambourine. And the Hebrew Baptists are all like, oh, what's going on? We, that's not how we do it. And they're just praising God. They're celebrating the miracle working power of a great God. Why? Because things went the way they hoped. Things went better than they had hoped. God did a tangible miracle in their life. 
But the question of our lives is not can we praise him when we're on the mountaintop of our faith? Can we bring that same energy when we're in the valley of decision? Can we bring that same praise and song to the Lord about his goodness and his strength and how he fights our battles when we're waiting on our prodigal children to return home? Can we bring that same level of praise when the doctor's report doesn't give us a favorable outcome? Can we bring that same type of praise and same type of energy, not just when things are good, but when they're challenging, when our marriage is not where we want it to be, where our finances are not where they should be? Can we bring that same energy because praise is not about problems. Praise is about a person. And that person is Jesus Christ, and he never changes. He's worthy when things are good, and he's worthy when things are getting better. Let's pick up the story in Exodus chapter 15, verse 22. We're doing a little Bible study today. Is that okay, everybody? We're going to look at three chapters here. Verse 22 of Exodus. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? I imagine that's how they would say it. The, the emphasis was mine, so. <laughs> then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. I love for every problem that we face, if we, like Moses, will go to the place of prayer and cry out to God, he always folds in the solution with the problem. Shows him a piece of wood, not something that wasn't there, but he allowed his eyes to see something that was already there that would solve the problem in front of him. There, the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. And then here, here's where we get one of the covenant names of God, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord is my healer. For I am the Lord who heals you. And the Bible says they came to Elam where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees and they camped there near water. It's amazing. They, they arrived at Wesley Chapel near the springs and the palm trees, man, just on their journey. And they camped near water. And wouldn't you, if water was your greatest need, when you found it, wouldn't you kind of just set up shop there? Sometimes we can put our trust and confidence too much in a physical need. We, we, can, we can know that that's something that God wants to meet, but we can forget that God wants to take us on a journey. And because he brings us to one place, our source is not that spring of water. Our source is not that physical thing or that earthly thing. We have to know that God is our source, and if he provided it once, he'll provide it again. That we can continue to follow and trust him. But I am amazed how fast their song turned into complaining. Three days 72 hours after the Red Sea parted, and they literally walked on dry ground that was not dry that moment before for 221 miles. God did something amazing in their life, and it took three days to forget how powerful and how great God is. And their singing was quickly replaced with grumbling. Now we look at them and go, I don't get it. But then we do the very same thing. God does miracles in our life, maybe seemingly less demonstrative. But nonetheless, if you woke up with the nine systems that make up your body and they all worked appropriately yet again today, and we didn't give God praise as if that's normal, we can fall into this grumbling mindset, this complaining to where we leave Thanksgiving on November 23rd but then we keep moving on in grumbling and murmur. You know what grumbling is? I'm not worshiping. I don't like that song. Come on, you know. You know. It's just, you, just, you can't be satisfied with anything. Let's pick it up. The next chapter, stay with me. Exodus 16. Because what you thought was a season of your life turns into a chapter of your life, can turn into another book of your life. In Exodus 16, verse 1, the Bible says, The whole Israelite community set out 
from Elam. Now God's moving them again. They could have really thought, no, we got water, man. I don't want to go anywhere else. I don't want to go further in my faith. I don't want to trust you. I'm comfortable. And God's like, no, we're leaving. And they were led to the desert. Some of you may be in a desert today, a dry season. You're not hearing God like you once did. You're not as encouraged as you once was. It is really challenging for you to open your Bible and read. It was a lot of effort, more than normal, for you to get to this church. You could be in a desert. But then God brought them to that place, not to leave them there, but to carry them on to where he wanted them to be, which was the promised land. But the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. I'm amazed how fast our glory can turn into a grumble. I'm amazed that the Israelites then said, if we only had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, can you imagine wanting to die a slave instead of living free? Can you imagine being more infatuated with death than you are deliverance? This is the perspective that we can start to lose when we get a complaining and grumbling type of heart posture. I, I, I'm just like, what, what happened to the song? Where's, where's Miriam? Where's the tambourine? I'm a Baptist, but I want the tambourine now because everybody, what happened? There we sat around pots of meat, which sounds gross, and we ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. It's amazing how we can memorialize past seasons as if they were good. They were slaves. They were under a dictatorship. But yet they're in a place where their faith is being tested and they'd rather go back to the familiar and trust, than trust God for what he has for their future. It's amazing how we'll demonize the present and the future and overemphasize and memorialize past seasons. But the Bible says the latter house is greater than the former. I don't know where you're at in your faith, and I'm not demeaning that you may be in a tough season or have been through some tough things, but can I tell you your best days are ahead, that God has a hope and a future for you. If you'll keep on the journey, if you'll rid yourself of murmuring and complaining and just trust God that he will bring you to the place he promised, amen is right. We got we to stay in this mindset. But it's amazing how they just started the blame game. Anybody in their marriage ever do the blame game? Don't raise your hand. Okay, it's church. <laughs> We're never vulnerable. We're never transparent. Don't raise your hand. But point at somebody who you know struggles with. <laughs> but it's amazing how the blame came. To, oh, the past was so much better. I wish we would have just died there. We had food and it was lots of meat and we just ate all. We got seconds and thirds and now we don't even have water and it's your fault. It's like the husband. The husband blames the wife. The wife blames the kids. Kids kick the dog. Dog <laughs> kicks the cat. Cat eats the mouse, right? It just, it just can create this perpetual blame instead of taking ownership. And I understand the blame game because we need to discharge that pain. We need to release that frustration, that unmet expectation that's very real in our life. We need to shift it. It's somebody's fault. No, it can't be my fault. I can't just live in faith. I can't just own some responsibility. No, I mean, accountability sounds good in church, but I don't really want to live it out in my life. I'd rather blame you for the situation I'm in. This is the people that God is dealing with and maybe still dealing with today in our own lives. Exodus 16, 4, watch how gracious God is. I love this. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. Yet again, they're murmuring and complaining as if God didn't do enough for them. They're just focused on what they don't have, blind to what is right in front of them, to where they're going. Yet God says, okay, I'm about to make it rain Panera bread. Just you get a bagel and you get a cinnamon toast and you get a baguette, which you should never get because they're hard and they'll break your teeth. I mean, like... But just miracles upon miracles after 400 years of slavery and bondage. How did God's people become so entitled? How did they become so prideful? Instead of knowing that God loves to meet the needs of your life. The Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. We don't really like that. Because that puts us in the boat of trust too much. That puts us out across the shore where we really don't have control anymore. We rather live by facts than live by faith. We almost as Christians in today's world will reject having a need 
as if it's not the very vehicle God uses to attract his power and supply. What if we saw our needs differently? Oh, praise God, I have a need. But we didn't focus on it like the Israelites did and stare at it. Oh, this is hard. Oh, just mumble. But what if we looked at the need and realized that we could look up from the need and see the supplies on the way? If there's never a need, God can never supply. But Paul said in Philippians, I will supply all your needs according to my riches and glory in Christ Jesus. What if we quit blaming the devil on every need we had? And just saw, what if God is allowing that need in our life so that he can show himself powerful to us? So that he can make it rain down a miracle in our life that we really needed so that it would help us with our relationship with him. Because just hearing a sermon is not doing it. But if God can give you an experience, you will never be at the mercy of another argument. And what if your need was a platform that God wanted to show you his glory in a powerful way? Let's keep reading Exodus 16, verse 6. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Next chapter, chapter 17, verse 1. The whole Israelite community set out again. God will bring you to a place, but he probably won't leave you there. As soon as you get comfortable in your new step of faith on the spiritual journey, God will say, hey, let's go. No, man, I just, it feels good. And God will say, keep following me in this journey. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst. It's amazing to me in this story, in these three chapters, that it's not just a season. It's not just a, a bad hair day. It's the heart posture. It's their disposition. I, I'm amazed that in chapter 15, they're thirsty. In chapter 16, they're hungry. In chapter 17, they're thirsty again. It sounds like a road trip with my kids. <laughs> or what we also call a Tuesday. Has your kids ever went to the pantry if you have them? Or maybe you're still a kid and you go to the pantry and you're just like, we don't have nothing. They're all happy like when you go to Costco. They're like, God is good. Brownie brittle. Oh, no. Oh. And, and then they come to a place where you just, you're still working on it. You still have a plan. You still have the ability to meet all their needs. You just haven't supplied it just in that moment that they feel that they, they need it really bad. And so all their singing and gratitude leaves and they just become unpleasable. Oh, just my kids? Cool. That's awesome. Thank you. You're like, no, I'm never, never, next point. Never heard that. It, it, it's amazing how they can just be in there. We never have anything to which it's my joy as a parent to go, but we've got carrots. <laughs> no, Cheetos. It's orange. I want Cheetos. Isn't it amazing? Like my kids, I don't know about yours. They, they only want things that's, that end in O. Like Cheerios, Doritos. Oreos or burritos. I kind of want a burrito right now. It's like, why do we have this attitude of ingratitude all of a sudden? For three chapters, God is doing mighty miracles in the Israelites' life, both past, present, and he has them planned for their future. But we see nine times in three chapters the word grumble. We see three times in those three chapters the word quarreling. And then we see two times where they're testing God. They have the wrong disposition. God's people should be known as representation of his goodness and his faithfulness and his joy and his grace and his peace. But the Hebrew people have a disposition to where the qualities that they're showcasing are unsatisfied, unpleasable, and frustrated. What about you? How do people see God through your life? What are the inherent qualities that you're showcasing, especially when you're going through hardship? I love how in this 
uh, verse, verse 17, watch Moses again. What does he do? He goes back to the place of prayer. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. He ended up fearing his life. He was like, they're too hard to lead. They're ungrateful. They're never satisfied. They're hungry, or as we like to say, hangry. Anybody? You know what the definition of hangry is? I'll put it on the screen for you. <laughs> hangry, a state of anger and irritability resulting from being hungry. Hunger causing a negative change in emotional state. Anger fueled by hunger. Anybody been hangry before? It's like sometimes I just need a meal. Sometimes I just need a nap. It's amazing how they're actually at a place where they're hangry. It, I mean, can us men just apologize now that, honey, I'm sorry for what I said when I was hangry. But the Israelites seem to have a spiritual gift of grumbling. It's like they went to the growth track and they scored grumbling. You're gifted at it. And you know those type of people. You, you try to avoid them. You, you see them coming and you're like, oh, God. You know. And you sh but you know Debbie Downer's coming. And as she begins to talk, all you hear is beep, beep. She's just backing up the verbal toxins of everything being wrong like a dump truck. And she's about to unload it on you. He's about to dump it on you like you cared. <laughs> and we do care. But what's the one question that triggers that verbal vomit? Come on, you know it. How are you? How are you? <laughs> well, I was good and my car broke. And that made me late to work. And then I lost my job because my car broke. Now I'm broke. And then I got home, didn't have any money. Went to the bill. When you know in the mailbox, there was a bunch of bills. And I'm sitting there getting my bills that I can't pay because I'm broke, because my car broke, my job, blah, blah, blah. And they're just going on. And then the dog bit me. And now I had to go to urgent care to pay a bill I didn't have. I probably got rabies. I'm going to die. It doesn't matter. I don't have any friends anyway. <laughs> and you're just slowly walking away. But as a good Christian, what do you do? You pray for them. Lord, please let the rabies work. I mean, Jehovah Rapha, Lord, please heal their diseases. I love the quote by Mark Twain. He said, don't complain and talk about all your problems. 80% of the people won't care. The other 20% will think you deserve them. <laughs> and that's funny, but I think what we learn from this text is our complaining doesn't yield what we want in our life. It produces hardship. It produces bad perspectives. It actually cripples you, infects those around you, and is a poor representation of the God who can save you and do anything in your life. For three chapters, we see this same spirit that wasn't a moment. It was a, it was a spirit operating in their life. And I just thought, man, while we got family coming into town and while we've got all these unmet expectations that are already there, but they seem to surface in this season of the calendar, would it be good for the people of God to reevaluate our disposition? Wouldn't it be good to use the Bible and the metaphor that Scripture tells us that it is a mirror to where we look at it and we don't try to change it, but we let it change us? Can we ask God, Lord, if there's anything in my life, would you expose it and reveal it so that you can ultimately heal it? Can we go there today as we close this message out? I want us to read this verse together. I'm going to put it on the screen, Philippians Come on, not a soft, a loud. Let's read it together. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. It may be hard for you to find something to be thankful for. I know there's seasons where you have to look really, really deep and dig really, really hard to find something. But can I tell you, there's always something to be thankful for. Can we as the people of God, even while we're still asking and praying on the God who hears and answers our prayers, can we have a disposition that is not like the Hebrew people in the Old Testament as they're going to the promised land, but can we have a Christian dip disposition that says, I'm thankful before the miracle. I'm thankful in the waiting. I'm thankful when I don't know how it's going to work out. I'm trusting that God is who he says he is and he will do what he said he will do. Anybody? Point one I want to give you today is complaining is the fruit of a deeper root. 
I can't tell you and I can't tell me to stop complaining. It's not going to work because that's a band-aid approach. That would be like a doctor treating symptoms without giving you a diagnosis. And we would call that malpractice. Well, as a pastor, we just can't try to modify our behavior and think that's going to last. Let's look at the verse again, Exodus 15, where we see that complaining has a deeper root issue. Verse 23, it said, When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Notice that grumbling follows bitterness. Notice in the scripture what the root is and what the fruit is. The fruit is grumbling. It's the result of a deeper issue. But the root cause of the grumbling and complaining and murmuring and disgruntled and never being satisfied and just always frustrated and blaming everybody else, there's a deeper root and it's the root of bitterness. My question for us today is what is your mouth saying that your heart needs to know? What what is your life indicating that you need to look below the hood? You need to look below the surface. What has made you resentful? What has made you dissatisfied? And it's manifesting audibly to others and verbally in your own life. What happened? Are you in a place of bitterness? Are you in a season where you've come to this place, God's done some things, and you really believe he's going to do some things, but you're in Mara, and you're bitter? What happened that puts you in this place? What situation were you mistreated in? Is it your marriage? Are you not getting what you feel you deserve? Is it a parental wound? Your, your father who did, never told you verbally he loved you created a root of bitterness that you've tried to mask over all your life, but it keeps tailing you and finding you in these moments. And you seem to not be able to overcome it. Is your bitterness towards God? You prayed for the baby, yet you don't have it. You prayed for the financial provision, yet the lights got turned off. What's caused you to experience bitterness? The Bible says, then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. We see here that there is a deeper root to our complaining, and it is the root of bitterness. Something in our life has soured us. Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's a church. I'm sorry for that. Maybe it was a pastor. And you've thrown away God based on the behavior of his people. And you're bitter. But can I tell you, as Moses found the solution to that bitter water, God wants to give you his presence. God wants to give you his peace. God wants to give you one word. He wants to give you one fresh idea that can turn those waters of bitterness sweet again. He wants to give you one moment in worship, one moment meeting a friend in the lobby, one moment getting that text from a church member, one moment, one word in prayer to give you hope again. And he wants to heal you, not just physically. It's why we get the covenant name Jehovah Rapha right here in this chapter that God understands what's happened to you. God cares about what's happened to you. And he wants to turn those bitter water sweet again with his presence. He wants to give you his word and his love and his grace, and he wants to bring emotional healing to you. He wants to take that father wound or that mother wound or that church wound, and he wants to just get in there and just heal it. You need to let him. It may feel like it's going to hurt because it's infected, but if you don't let him do it, it's going to manifest in every other relationship in your life, and it's going to destroy him. The Bible says, I am the Lord who heals you. We have to deal not with the fruit, but with the root. Number two, complaining dishonors God. We see that in Exodus 16. Moses also said, you will know what that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against him. This one got me. No, I'm not grumbling against God. It's my boss. It's my direct report. It's my parents. They just don't understand what it's like. It's my teacher. I'm not, it's not about God. It's about them. And he says, no, no, no. As a Christian, 
You're killing your witness. As a Christian, you're supposed to represent me. And what you do doesn't just run them down. It runs me down. And I understand why you're doing it. There's a gap. There's a pain gap. But complaining dishonors God. Here's how I wrote it down in our notes. Complaining indicates a disbelief in what God can do or a dissatisfaction in what God has done. Isn't that true? We're either not satisfied with what he has done or we don't really believe he will do anything about it. We feel hung out to dry. We feel all alone in our situation. What if instead of going, I've got a bad job, we just praise God that we had a job? What if we went, God, I hate my job because I've got to drive on 275 and I get in traffic. Why can't we just praise God that we're in a car? Probably one of our two. Instead of blowing up our husband or just ripping our wife for what she's not or what he's not yet, and God hasn't fully done the work. What if we just think, praise God, I'm not lonely. That God's given me a spouse. God's given me a companion. I may not be wearing Gucci, but I know the ultimate designer. Why can't we just be thankful for what God has done in our life? It's amazing how we can live in an apartment and want a town home, have a town home, then want a home, have a home, then want a mansion, then complain that it's too big to clean. It's like we're always pushing our joy to a future date. And some of us may say, well, I had the right to complain. I, I bring this money in. I did this. I, I bought this house. I, I provide for this family. Whoa, careful. The Bible says in Deuteronomy, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. As Christians, our disposition should be every accolade, every achievement, every ability, every accomplishment comes from the mighty hand of a gracious God. And I'm thankful. I have a long list of prayer requests, but I'm not going to let my praise turn into problems. I'm going to let my praise be focused on the person of Jesus. That's what Paul told us in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians. The Bible says, rejoice, pray, and give thanks in all? Yeah, that one. Give thanks in all circumstances. Now, what this sermon is not, this sermon is not some uh, smile your way to heaven <laughs> and, and not acknowledge that we go through hard things, not acknowledge that we have real fears, not acknowledge that we do experience season of hardship and lack and betrayal and abandonment and rejection. Those things are real. And this is not what this sermon is saying. Just overcome it because God loves you. Listen, if they give you sardines when you ordered steak, send it back. If you get the hotel room and there's bed bugs, don't just be like, I can't complain. I heard a sermon. No. If you're robbed at gunpoint, don't praise God. Call the police. Then praise God, right? Just, we got to keep our mindsets right about this. The idea of this sermon is that we would be watchful. We would be watchful to, for situations that can cause bitterness to get in our life and we would make a choice to rejoice and we'd be okay with the process of prayer and we would reject dishonor and we would just embrace tough season knowing that tough seasons don't last but tough people do. Number three, and we'll pray, complaining causes us to miss God's best. This isn't a heaven or hell issue. Your salvation is a free gift from Christ. But you can have different experiences on earth as you're journeying to heaven. The Israelites were journeying from bondage to the promised land. And as God brings us to heaven one day, and praise God for heaven. I, I'm not putting my hope in earth. Earth is a fallen world. Of cor course you're disappointed with earth. It was never supposed to satisfy you. But we are foreigners, the Bible says, passing through this life, journeying to heaven. And may we understand that how we talk and how we act is creating the experiences we have. And it's not just a season, but it's chapters, and now it's books, because in Numbers 14, we've left Exodus, and we're still talking about the complaining in Numbers. Numbers 14, the Bible says, And Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? Will they never believe me, even after all the miraculous things I have done among them? Here they are, they, the people of God, the Israelites, are on the border of the promised land. And they're going to miss the promise. God's done. He's fed up. But thank God that Moses intercedes. 
And he steps in the gap and he said, God, if you, if you don't intervene, if you don't allow them to go to the promised land, it's your reputation that's going to be messed up. He said, well, I'll let their children go, but this generation will never see the promise because they've lived their life blind to the blessings. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss God's best for me. I know you're in church today because you don't want to miss God's best for you. And again, I'm not talking about heaven or hell. I'm talking about the level of life you're living, the quality of your life as a person of faith, that can we stop complaining and live grateful? Can we just understand that it has a deeper root, that it dishonors God, and it will cause us to miss God's best for our life? It will. How? Take action. Act. What does that mean? Address the root issue. Commit to heal. And trust an unknown future to a known God. Can we just act? We don't have to mask over like the complaints aren't legitimate, like they're not real. God would probably even validate the hardship some of us are going through. But can we rise above it? Embrace the power of the Holy Spirit? And not live blinded to the issue, but just make a decision. I'm going to address it. This has plagued me long enough. As a matter of fact, it's plagued my family line long enough. I'm going to address the root issue. I'm going to commit to heal. I'm going to get into a city group. I'm going to get around God's people. And I'm also going to let the God who heals, Jehovah Rapha, do a new fresh work in me. But I'm not going to live by facts. I'm going to live by faith. I'm going to trust an unknown future to a known God. Amen, everybody? Let's pray together.